Toba's greetings. I'm your host, Dr. Wolfiel, and when I'm not appearing to lost souls after they open this Scooby-Doo puzzle box, I'm here at the Wolfiel Air reviewing movies. Continuing October 2022, I'm finally reviewing the original Hellraiser, a film about demons really into BDSM, written and directed by Clive Barker and released in 1987. We've only really reviewed the later, ultra-shitty director video Hellraiser movies made when the Weinsteins became especially desperate for cocaine money, but it's about time I celebrated the franchise's brighter beginnings. There are 11 Hellraiser movies now, including a new remake on uh, Hulu. After so many films, especially with so many of them very questionable in quality, it's easy to forget that the franchise has its roots in literature, born singularly from the mind of Clive Barker, an English philosopher turned author who was also one of few alive to be considered a true master of horror. Not just in literature, but also films, comics, toys, paintings, and even several video games. The three most iconic of Barker's many works, though, are Candyman, Nightbreed, and of course, Hellraiser, which began as a novella titled The Hellbound Heart, published in 1986 within the third Night Visions anthology. Barker clearly had a strong intention to adapt this work into film because the adaptation was released only a year after the novella was published, but unlike previous adaptations of Clive Barker's work, which he felt left a lot to be desired, Barker would direct the Hellbound Heart adaptation himself making Hellraiser the first of only three films Clive Barker has ever directed. Despite Hellbound Heart and its adaptation Hellraiser having different titles, their stories are almost exactly the same, which shouldn't really be a surprise, seeing as the author adapted the story for film himself. There are only very minor differences to the plot and characters from page to screen, and the changes for the film are mostly for the better, but the endings are admittedly really different. The only things missing from the novella that make it an essential companion to the film is background information of key characters, explanations of character motivations, and additional lore about the film's supernatural elements. Removing these pieces of exposition, though, does make the movies pace faster and keeps everything more mysterious, so the cuts and changes Barker did make to his story do help the film while also giving fans of the movie a reason to read the story it's based on to find out more about the world Barker created. I'll go into the changes and cuts as I go along, though, so let's just begin my review of the original Hellraiser. Come here, damn you, I want to touch you. Hellraiser tells the story of a couple, Larry and Julia Cotton, who move into an old house together, which belonged to Larry's late grandmother. How long since you were here? Oh, the better part of ten years. Here's where a lot of superficial changes from the novella come in. In the story, Larry is named Rory, a much more British-y sounding name, and the setting itself was England in the original story. The film's financier, New World Pictures, convinced Barker to make the movie more commercial by having it take place in the USA, which pretty much only involved redubbing some of the British accents with American accents. Okay, stop. I'm not gonna be able to stand up. So lie down which admittedly isn't totally seamless. You are right. And the movie still looks like it takes place in England regardless. Ultimately, this is a gothic European horror film through and through. We can make it work here. I've got a terrific job. You're back on your own turf. Now, Larry isn't the only owner of his late grandmother's estate, though. Shit. It was also willed to Larry's brother, Frank, who squatted in the house before Larry's arrival. The early stages of the novella dealt heavily with Frank's backstory. He was a hedonist pursuing greater levels of pleasure, so he essentially goes from banging hookers to trying to court sadomasochistic demons. We've all been down that road. <laughs> College, am I right? I wanted to sell it after the old lady died. I couldn't get Frank to agree. I guess he needed a hideout or something. We just see little glimpses of Frank's backstory through these fun mementos left behind and his purchase of the film's MacGuffin during the film's opening scene. Take it. It's yours. A Le Marchand box, the Lament Configuration, a puzzle box that, when solved, supposedly will take its wielder to a new realm of pleasure, but only, as Obi-Wan Kenobi would say, from a certain point of view. <laughs> Summoned from the Lament Configuration is the Order of the Gash, a group of demonic BDSM enthusiast Cenobites, which disappoints Frank, who in the novella was hoping the box would just summon hot babes with fat asses. I'm not kidding about that. We don't always get what we want, but the Cenobites get Frank's immortal soul, at least for a while. <laughs> Frank's brother Larry, though, was experiencing some eternal tortures in a different way, stuck in a loveless marriage with his wife, Julia. I just don't understand you. 
But unbeknownst to Larry, his wife's coldness towards him has something to do with Brother Frank. There's more of a history between Julie and Frank than he's aware of. You're Julia, right? That's right. Who are you? I'm Brother Frank. You see, a week before Larry and Julia got married, Frank visited Julia and, well, uh, fucked her. Fucked her nice and good. So yeah, Frank secretly cucked his own brother, but it wasn't anything personal, though. Frank only fucked Julia because she was another sexual conquest for him. Frank fucked anyone he could fuck, but Julia, unfortunately, fell in love with Frank, and Larry never could compare to his brother. I mean, they don't call him Frank for nothing. The guy's got a foot long swinging between his legs. I'm honestly surprised that thing could fit inside Julia's bun. I'll do anything you want. Of course, Larry and Julia aren't a childless couple. They do also have a daughter, so this is a bit like Beetlejuice if you think about it. Just without the fun banana boat song in Sandworms and with more erotic torture scenes. It's showtime. <laughs> The cotton daughter, Kirsty, is an adult, though, played by Ashley Lawrence. This is probably the biggest character change from the novella. I said I found a room. Well, wait, I thought you were going to stay with us for a while. Dad? In the novella, Kirsty is a young woman who works with and has a crush on Rory, a.k.a. Larry. But in this movie, she's the daughter of Larry from his first marriage before Julia. This is a big house. You like? <laughs> Making Kirsty the daughter works a lot better because it gives her more of an emotional investment in what happens inside the house and makes her more relatable as a heroine than some bitch being attracted to this guy for some reason. In the novella, you at least have the benefit of walls of text to explain what a chick like this would see in a dude like this. Instead, though, Kirsty is romantically involved with this dude, who's kind of useless and looks like one of the guys from Tears for Fears. So why didn't you stay at Larry's house? There's plenty of room. Oh yeah, there's room. There's Julia. It's ultimately more efficient storytelling-wise to make all the main characters in the plot a family, and I gotta hand it to Clive Barker being an author who can make changes to his own story that benefit the story as a film, not being so precious with the source material that he's above changing or cutting stuff. Hellraiser was Clive Barker's first film as a director. He was clueless at the time about the technical aspects of filmmaking, but the crew and the cast were very accommodating of Barker's inexperience on a film set. Despite Hellraiser being a film by a first-time director, though, you wouldn't really know it looking at it, and I think that comes down to Barker not just being a great writer, but also having a strong sense for visuals. You read The Hellbound Heart and are treated to vivid descriptions of disgusting scenes. Barker knew exactly what everything looked like in his head. The movie has a romantic old-school horror film quality in its visuals and score, but it also has this eerie atmosphere surrounding it. The kind of thing horror films really thrive on when you never feel comfortable during your viewings. <laughs> From the cinematography, the soundscape, and all the way down to the uneasy relationship dynamics within the Cotton family. The gory, chain-filled world of the Cenobites is only briefly observed, but it leaves a strong impression. The real horror of Hellraiser, though, lies within the Cotton household itself. This house feels wrong. Even when the family moves in, it still looks like a shithole. It's a huge house, but it still feels claustrophobic inside, like the characters have no breathing room, like the walls are closing in on them. It's a creepy, disgusting place that not only feels dangerous, but also feels like it's hiding a dark secret from the very beginning of the film. I thought half of it was your brother's. He's probably behind bars someplace. Well, what is that dark secret? After Larry cuts his hand on a nail, <laughs> the useless motherfucker has to bring it to his wife hanging out in the former meth lab room to take a look at it. Larry's the only guy who can get this much blood all over the place just from cutting himself on a loose nail, and the blood is more than enough to resurrect Frank, which is a lovingly, disgustingly rendered effects sequence, which feels like it would have been right at home with Rob Bettine's effects work in The Thing. Yeah, I know how to pronounce Rob Bettine's name now. Essentially, Frank was trapped in the depths of hell, but the spilled blood of his brother returns him to the realm of the living, but only as a hollow husk. But not the kind of hollow husk that Larry is. <laughs> Frank needs more blood for his body to be restored and enlists the aid of Julia, his former brief lover. Please, God, help me! <laughs> And Julie obliges Frank's wishes just out of the hope that he'll eventually dick her down again. She's a total simp. You'll do it. Yes. I will.
Speaking of simps, Julia carries out Frank's will by luring pathetic losers from various bars to her home. Dude's somehow even more pathetic than her own husband. I get lonely sometimes. With the promises of sex and after the victims get hammered, Julia hammers them again, never once letting them nail her first. And Frank, well, he reaps all the benefits as he starts to become whole again, through Julia making promises that fellas will get her whole. Every drop of blood you spill puts more flesh on my bones. And we both want that, don't we? This is a bit of a difference from the novella. In the story, Julia stabs her victims. She doesn't use a hammer. But in horror movies, especially during the 80s, you see stabbings all the time. So I figure Barker wanted to do something a bit different here. And honestly, it's a lot more brutal than stabbing. Come to daddy. Regaining his nerve endings, though, also makes Frank capable of feeling pain again. My nerves are beginning to work again. And, you know, not having skin isn't the most comfortable condition to be in. So he becomes much more demanding of victims from Julia, especially out of fear that the Cenobites who once captured him will find him once more. Then find me somebody else before they come looking. A running theme of Hellraiser is that the male characters are all completely useless. Frank is unable to perform murders himself, Kirstie's forgettable boyfriend offers little to no aid during the story, and come on, just look at Larry here. Just look at him! <laughs> Now, I know I haven't talked much about the Cenobites in this Hellraiser video, but for good reason. The Cenobites aren't really the villains of the original Hellraiser. Frank and Julia are the main antagonists of the film. While the Cenobites are more in the peripheral until the final act of the film, where they become more of a threat to the heroine Kirstie, who eventually encounters her Uncle Frank, and, you know, the unfortunate thing is that this isn't the most uncomfortable interaction somebody has ever had with their uncle before. Come to Daddy! Get the fuck off of me! Not by a long shot. Bet you make your daddy so proud, don't you, beautiful? And Kirstie escapes with the lament configuration and, and runs off until she passes out. This is why you need to stay hydrated before fleeing from your uncle. You never know when it might happen. Are you all right? Confined within a hospital bed with nothing else to entertain her except a TV playing the Blooming Flower Channel, Kirsty decides to solve the lament configuration, unleashing the Cenobites. Not to be confused with the delicious treats of the same name that will also kill you, just in a different way. The box. You opened it. We came. It's just a bottle box! The Cenobites, like Cenobites, come in four flavors in this movie. The lead and breakout star of the film, Pinhead, played by Doug Bradley, obviously named for the pins on his head and not because he's a dipshit. Who are you? Demons to some, <laughs> angels to others. It was a mistake! The Chatterer, named for his chattering teeth, Butterball, who earned his name for being a fat fuck, and the most creatively named Female Cenobite, named after what's between her legs and also on her neck. Of course, none of these undignified nicknames are the actual names of these demons, but much to Clive Barker's chagrin, they've stuck. Especially the lead Cenobite's name, Pinhead, whose actual official name is Hell Priest, but whatever, his name is Pinhead. Nobody will know what you're talking about if you call him Hell Priest. Just gotta live with it. The pinhead of the original novella wasn't really specified by any name, though. It was described as adorned with jeweled pins, androgynous, and with a female voice, so it seems like elements of the novella character were likely split between pinhead and the female Cenobite. We can't. You solved the box. We came. Now you must come with us. Inspired by the patrons of an S&M bar that Clive Barker frequented, Pinhead and his disciples are a departure from the norm for horror villains of the 80s. Sure, Freddy Krueger spoke a hell of a lot, but he usually said goofy shit. It will do kill you. The service will. <clears throat> Pinhead speaks in a calm, cold, calculating voice, and his dialogue has a certain poetry to it. We have such sights to show you. The Order of the Gash is essentially a religious sect of Cenobites, beings from another reality that may or may not be hell. Their leader in the novella is named the Engineer, whatever the hell this thing is supposed to be. 
Doesn't look like it has an engineering degree to me. The Cenobites and their purpose are vaguely defined, but that adds to their intrigue. Essentially, pain is pleasure to them. They thrive on inflicting pain upon tortured souls, and in order to continue this, they have some agents within the human realm no known as Eremites, or Puzzle Guardians, who stay close to the Lemarchen boxes, making sure they remain safe to distribute to future victims. Speaking of future victims, here's where I spoil the finale of Hellraiser. To avoid spoilers, skip to this time code. The Cenobites are unique entities within the horror genre. They're mysterious, but there's clearly a method to their madness. They're evil, but they are capable of being reasoned with to a certain extent, following a code of honor of sorts that Kirsty takes advantage of. Oh, man, don't break God. oh yes! He escaped you! Kirsty reveals that Frank escaped the Cenobites, and Pinhead allows Kirsty to lead the Cenobites to Frank on the condition that they'll maybe possibly spare Kirsty's life, which is good enough for Kirsty. I can lead you to him, and you, you can make him back instead of me. Maybe. She's not a fucking hell lawyer. She doesn't know how any of this shit works. But if you eat, we'll tear your soul apart. Meanwhile, Frank becomes whole again and puts Julia's hole to good use, giving the broad a nice good railing. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Kirsty, I want to see my father! Unbeknownst to Kirsty, Frank has taken her father, Larry's skin. And it shows that she has a lot on her mind that she didn't take a moment to notice the crudely done graft job her uncle did. But hey, Larry had some bad skin to begin with, so whatever. Come to daddy. Oh my god. Come to daddy. After some family drama, though, Kirsty draws her uncle to the Cenobites, who finally reclaim what is rightfully theirs. Jesus wept. <laughs> Savage as fuck! Surprisingly, though, the demons from a hell dimension aren't honorable in their agreement and try to take Kirsty along with them. So she manages to banish each back by reversing the puzzle box back to its unsolved configuration. Oh, and uh, Kirsty's boyfriend helps too, I guess. Not really, though. <laughs> Kirsty and her boyfriend toss the old puzzle box in the burning remains of the house, I guess, which is just a few random burning piles of wood. But the box is retrieved by the puzzle's guardian, comic book writer Alan Moore, who transforms into a badass dragon. Holy shit, that is cool as hell. Hellraiser, that is. What's your pleasure, sir? Hellraiser is a classic horror film, and, like most classic horror films, it unintentionally spawned the franchise. The Cenobites weren't meant to be the focus of the original movie. Much like the puzzle box, they served as a plot device to drive the true villains of the story to perform their horrific acts. A simple story about the desperate measures taken to escape from hell. But Pinhead and the other Cenobites were fucking cool. Designed to be more than just generic demons to propel a plot forward. Pinhead's only in eight minutes of Hellraiser, but you know damn well he's on every poster for the movie. Julia was intended by Barker to become the franchise's main antagonist throughout, but Pinhead was just too popular. Pinhead is the icon of the Hellraiser franchise for a lot of reasons, but I think what made him the face, or I should say head of the franchise, is the fact that he represents what the Cenobites are while simultaneously, ironically, being the least scary looking of them. Most of the other Cenobites are really freaky looking, but Pinhead is just a guy with nails in his head. Something memorable but not freaky enough to be recognized and accepted within the mainstream, like a Freddy Krueger or a Jason. It also helps, though, that Doug Bradley played the character of Pinhead with so much class. Oh, no tears, please. It's a waste of good suffering. The original Hellraiser, though, on its own, is a great horror film that also stands out from its contemporaries. The film features a ton of gore, but there's a beauty to the film's presentation of bloodshed, an offbeat artistry to it, and the film also has a haunting atmosphere surrounding it that both compels and also unnerves. I give Hellraiser a Frank out of Larry. I can't believe it took me 12 years as a horror channel to review the original Hellraiser, but it finally happened. Truly, this is an October miracle. Now you must come with us, taste our pleasures. 
This video is made possible through the pledges of my Patreon supporters, and I'd like to give a very special thanks to the kind folks pledged to my shoutouts tier. All of the support on Patreon means a lot to me, and it helps my dark influence continue to grow. If you like this video, like it, and if you loved it, click the subscribe and bell buttons for more vids. Be sure to also keep in touch by following me on social media at Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Dr. Wolfula. While I still have your attention, consider pledging to my Patreon to support the channel and get bonus content like previews, VIP Discord server access, private movie night streams, and credits in videos. Consider pledging at patreon.com slash drwolfula. Also, check out official Dr. Wolfula t-shirts and other merch on tpublic.com slash user slash drwolfula. Thanks for watching. See you all next time. Dr. Wolfula signing out.